So you're listening to Phonic FM 106.8 and on DAB Radio. I'm Kathy Towers and I have an amazing guest, comic, in in the room with me and that is Chloe Petz. Welcome, Chloe. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Such a pleasure. Oh, it's, it's, pleasure is all mine. I've, I've been enjoying <laughs> your comedy for a while, actually, on online. Um, though, though I hear this one's, this tour is a little bit different. If well, you I sort of say something nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of say it's a bit different. It is sort of still in my usual style, which I would say is cerebral laddishness, kind of, uh, I like to blend the, the high with the lowbrow. Um, mainly the lowbrow, I would say. <laughs> I'm probably probably doing myself too much credit there. But um, so, yeah, I guess the premise of this show is that um, before in other shows and other stand up, I've tried to sort of be quite polite and break these big ideas around gender and sexuality into sort of manageable bite sized chunks. But that seems not to have worked because, you know, um, hostility towards, you know, people that present a bit different gender wise seems to have raised in this country. So this show, I'm saying, well, if you haven't listened to me when I'm polite, then maybe you'll listen to me if I'm angry. And then that sort of spirals into the show being about sort of a love letter to anger and its uses and whether, you know, it's a good emotion or a bad emotion. Oh, good. So, so there's a bit of depth in that exploration there, isn't there? <laughs> there is a bit of depth, but I always try and um, I try and make things like lead with funny. So if I want to make a point and I can't make it funny, then it gets dropped from the show. So, yeah, yeah I think primarily it's a funny show, but it has um, pretensions of being deeper than it probably is. <laughs> yeah. That 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 reminds me of a point. I always wonder how much of your material, not not yours, but any comics material, sort of gets chopped before they edit it down to yeah, this is the juicy stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, like we we go through a massive editing process, right? So like, I've already started writing my show for next August, my new show for next August, um, which I'm taking to the Edinburgh Fringe and you start early because it takes a long time to work out what's funny and what's not and just get it into an order that's satisfying for the audience. So yeah, it takes a really long time to put these shows together. Um, and it can often be quite a vulnerable experience, like showing people material for the first time, because sometimes it's absolutely rubbish. Um, or sometimes it's just not quite there yet because you haven't had the full thought. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it's exciting to go back to having nothing, but also yeah, as I say, quite vulnerable and a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. And and how much do you sort of make up on the spot? I, I know everybody has a, some heckles prepared and such like, mm -hmm. but but uh, do how much do you adapt to your audience? Yeah, I love to I love to improvise and. Um... I on my tour I always do like sort of 20 or 25 minutes of crowd work at the beginning um because I just find that really fun and I really like to get to know the audiences and make it like a sort of unique and special uh, moment in that in that room so yeah and that, that's what keeps it fun because you don't just want to be saying the same lines over and over and over every day you want to make it unique and and feel like you're giving your audience something special so yeah I do a lot of messing around yeah. Oh, great. That's lovely. Uh, okay, I've got a bunch of questions here from people who are interested in in you and, and the work that you do. Oh, cool. And one from Nick is, where do you get your inspiration? Sort of just all over, really. Oh, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult question because it's like when you're inspired, it's really difficult to sort of localise where that's come from. But I'd say what happens is like an idea will pop into my head and then I guess what will happen is then I'll think in that situation, say it's a wedding, what would, and, and that, that the inspiration for the wedding would be, I've been at a wedding, I observe something that, that, that I think is funny and I think I can make a routine out of this. And then, so I guess that's the point of inspiration that Mick's asking about. And then you sort of have to work away at, the, the inspiration can only carry you so far. So then you have to work at it. And I would say what I would then do with the wedding is I would think, what would the character of Chloe Petz do at a wedding? And 
um, and then that sort of leads you to to write to to sort of flesh out the routine more. But then other times, other times things will just appear to you in a flash, and it will feel like it will feel like you know the gods have gifted you with a joke. So, um, uh, what's a good example of that? I had one where um, I read an article about. Um, you know how men can be better allies to women and it said that men if they're walking behind a woman late at night they should cross to the other side of the road to sort of let her know that they're not going to harm her mm -hmm. and i thought that was really funny that um like i could do that because i often get mistaken for a man and like the things that could come out of that and that just popped into my head and i was like yeah that's going to be a routine and that will work yeah, um, yeah. and then other routines we have to work a bit harder at I remember turning around and yelling at a guy to stop following me once. <laughs> Great. That, and, that sounds When I saw his powerful. face, I realised he wasn't following me at all. <laughs> he was absolutely <laughs> very fine by me. Uh, <laughs> well, better be better be safe than sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you describe your comedy style? I've I've heard that you you sort of see yourself as a bit of a split personality. Is that the <laughs> gender thing or? I would say cerebral laddishness is like what what I said earlier is probably yeah, yeah. a good way of, yeah. of describing that. And I think, yeah, I I want it to be thoughtful, but I primarily want it to be funny and silly. Um, and but but I think I'm quite no nonsense. I think I don't take any prisoners. Like I've certainly got a mean streak, but I hope that because I say it with um, with fun and kindness and the best intentions, and I'm never trying to punch down. I hope it always comes across as like a good natured banter rather than bullying. <laughs> yes, it does actually, in, in my view. But... Oh good. Yeah, I'm yeah. Pleased to hear that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Someone asked, what's it like being a non-male comic in what seems to still be a very male world of successful comedians? How do you navigate this? It's a difficult question to answer because well, I don't want to seem like I'm being too idealistic or like um, discarding like incredibly important issues, but it feels like we are sort of moving generally in the right direction. And I hope that the incredible women comics that are coming through now are inspiring, you know, another generation of, of women comics that can come through so that in the next 10, 20 years, we'll see that swell of, of women uh, in the industry. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's really difficult to answer, I think. Sometimes I find myself in all male spaces and um, you can really notice like just the classic things that you notice with, in like if you work in an office and you're in a meeting with all men, like your yeah. voice can get lost and you feel like you're not being listened to or you feel like by bringing up like, you know, something vaguely feminist, you're being sort of the militant one that's like trying to spoil everyone's fun. Um <laughs> So I think situations like that, I can feel a bit frustrated, but I think it's about, you know, making sure that you're trying to be part of the solution, which is talking to your colleagues about these issues and and talking to the people that can actually make changes, you know, in the like in the TV production companies or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so I think the way that I cope with it is that. I acknowledge it, I talk to someone about it, and then I see what we can do to change. Yeah. Sorry, that was a very nebulous answer that took me a long time. It's just, it, very, it was a great question, and um, I wanted to think about it properly. Yeah. Um, and you've been on a few different TV and radio programmes now with um, panels and things. Yeah. And they're often just one, one or two women and the predominantly men. How do you feel... Or do you feel supported by the men at that level, comedy? Um, it varies. Like, I know there's loads of blokes who are so aware of the fact that, like, you know, the history of these panel shows that have been very male orientated and very like competitive and very shouting over one another, and you can tell that there are men who are aware of that that try and make space for everyone else on the panels, and that's really lovely. But what I will say is, recently I did a panel show with which was hosted by Rosie Jones and the two team captains were Catherine Ryan and Judy Love. And then the two contestants or the two, you know, comedians were me and Scarlett Moffat. So that was a complete, you know, all woman cast. Wow. <laughs> and I have to say the mood and energy of that was the best 
television I've ever done because it was like, yeah, it was just very communal and very supportive and very like, like not very combative at all. And we, it felt like we were all trying to make a great show together rather than in spite of each other. And I also think a factor in that is like, because Rosie speaks more slowly, you have to wait for her to finish. Yeah. And that sort of encouraged like this environment of we let each other finish our, finish sentences rather than trying to one up each other. So that was like a beautifully unique experience and kind of a glance at the other side. But that's that that's not me saying I want a race of men I just think there's like it would be nice to have a bit more of a balance of you know n not just the people on the shows but the production team as well like just just having women represented is just just really cool and makes everyone feel um, more represented and included yeah remind me of uh, I, I used to go away on these weekenders with a big bunch of women about 20 of us and we'd we'd take over a, a back room in a pub for our evening meals and we used to tell jokes and we'd, we'd deliberately take it in turns and encourage everybody to have a go. Yeah. Um, I can't remember Absolutely. any jokes these days, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we loved that even the most shy person would stand up and tell a joke. Yeah. A big cheer. That's really mm. Yeah, it's really sweet. Okay, let me see what else I've got. M Coombs, she says, Kathy, could you give Chloe my deets? <laughs> uh, um, she wants to do a podcast with you, but... Uh, all um, right. I'll, I'll let let you know those details, of course. <laughs> and her big question was, if you had to give up one food, what would you hate to give up? Oh, great question. Maybe chips. I love chips so much. I I I have chips. I've actually reduced it. I have them probably like twice a week now, but I just really love them. But. What's, what can I do without? Do you like the fat chips or the thin chips? A great question. I like to have both options available to me because sometimes I want different things. So sometimes I want French fries absolutely slathered in mayonnaise. And then sometimes I want fat chips with ketchup. And, you know, that that's when, when people say I contain multitudes, that's what I mean by it, you know. I want a variety of chips available to me. Mm. I think that's that's probably my answer. I love, I love like cake as well. Just just chips and cake. I could live off that. Okay, so, so if if somebody wanted to seduce you, they could invite you around for a two course meal of two types of chips followed by cake. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, would work. That's that, put the word out. If people want to invite me around for chips and cake, I'll be there. Lovely. Okay. <laughs> But back to the sort of the more conventional questions. How did you? How do you get into? How do you get into comedy? That's a different question to how did you get in. Yeah, um, I would say you've just got to start doing it. So, go to um, open mics and do as many as your, as many as your schedule and your brain will allow you. Because I know that it's a it's a very mentally taxing thing to do to put yourself out there in that way so much. So. I think the thing I would say to people is write your first five minutes and don't necessarily worry too much about whether it, whether it's perfect or not. The most important thing is that you get on stage for, and for the first two or three years, being on stage is enough. Write as much as you can, but don't prioritize it. Just prioritize getting comfortable being on stage because as soon as you're comfortable being on stage, that's when you can get really good at stand up because you just sort of start breathing on stage and that allows you not to act out of a state of panic but out of a state of calm that's and a I really think... good piece of advice that yeah <laughs> breathe absolutely. on stage because otherwise breathe. you starve your brain of oxygen don't you exactly <laughs> oh, and and just also remember when you're on stage no one knows when a punchline was meant to be so if they don't laugh don't berate them for it just move on and pretend you didn't you didn't mean for them to laugh in the first place I remember one chap I, I saw, he kept, he kept up and go, oh, well, that one didn't work. Here, I'll try another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but bad practice, I would say that is. <laughs> yeah. So that was from Sarah. Nikki wants to know, what are some of your best lines for hecklers? <laughs> it's funny because I don't really have any, like, specific put downs. Like, I don't have any scripted ones. I kind of respond to whatever heckle I get in the moment um i'm just trying to think if there have been any ones that i've been proud of 
But sometimes I think just a world time shut up can work. Like if you if you're busy, shut up. <laughs> shut up, I'm busy. Um so yeah, I feel like I can't answer that question very well. I'm really sorry. But I, I just never have them planned. I just um I just trust trust the old brain in the moment to to well, handle it. What have I got here? What has been the most fun opportunity that you've had through comedy to date? Probably going to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. Mm. Um so I went there last year and it's amazing because they treat the international acts so well. So they put you up in a hotel, pay for all your flights, take you on all these day trips and stuff. And you just do like a show a day. And it was amazing because like I got to know all of these like Australian or other international comics and we partied a lot and, you know, explored this incredible city and this incredible country. And I just felt so lucky that, that work had taken me there and I was paid to be there. And I'm going back again this year and I'm so excited. You're coming to Exeter. Mm -hmm. Have you been down to Devon before? Yeah, yeah. I've been. I've spent a fair amount of time in Devon, just holidays and stuff. I love it. It's great. It's a fantastic county. It is. And it's, it's very difficult for, for um, people who are doing or learning stand-up to get around because you have to travel so far for gigs. Why not put one on yourself? Well, I I do improv actually. So, oh, so do you? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, I do put on little things from time to time. Right. Because yeah. uh, I did try stand up, but I can't remember things very much. <laughs> <laughs> do you make references to local things when you do your crowds? Crowd work? Not really. If if I'm like if I'm in a place that I perceive to be rubbish, I might roast it a bit. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, give them a little bit of stick. Yeah, but I, I did um. Kent on the weekend which is where I grew up so I was able to be very specific about the places that I slagged off then and I do enjoy it it's fun people love to love to get bands for about their hometowns but if something pops pops in I will do specific stuff but again I'm not I'm not forcing it if I don't think it's funny if you hadn't gotten into comedy what do you think you'd be doing it's honestly so difficult for me to even conceive of that because there was just no part of my brain that thought I would ever be doing anything else like I it's I, I had sort of like a dogged kind of belief that like no this is this is what I meant to this is what I meant to do this is what I want to do I suppose it's a bit stupid or arrogant or something but I think I probably I really love people and I love the way people's brains work and I like helping people so I think I probably would have done a degree in like psychotherapy or something like that um that's my main job oh is it <laughs> yeah oh cool nice yeah, um, yeah. well yeah we, we could do a we could do a job swap swap if you want um yeah i, I don't i don't think it the phoenix would be very keen of me turning up instead of you <laughs> oh it's been a long tour so if you wouldn't mind covering it i'd be very happy <laughs> i'll give it a go then <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right then and i'll put, put me on zoom with some of your clients i'll sort them out <laughs> Anything that you would like to say, what you, like um, the question you never get asked that you'd like to answer? Um, it would probably be something to do with football and then I'd speak for the next half an hour on my thoughts on Roy, Roy Hodgson's sacking, which has just happened just now. I'm a big Crystal Palace fan. It needed to happen. I'm very sad to have lost Roy because he was uh, a great servant of the club and a legend of the game, but I think it was time for us to part ways and you know, onwards and upwards for Crystal Palace now. It's been a bit of a dark period in the club's history, but I hope things can start moving in the right direction. Yeah. I saw your uh, piece on TV with uh, the women's football team. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, it was really fun. Yeah, I loved that. Yeah. So I went and uh, like did a day in the life of training with the women's football team and it was it was really cool. Yeah, it was it was great to get to know them. And I think because, you know, in the women's game, they're not really celebrities yet when they're sort of at the lower levels. It just felt like hanging out with your mates and they were incredibly kind and generous with their time and really uh, patient with me and my sort of uh, uh, very rudimentary football skills. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you like to watch rather than participate usually? I will play sometimes. I'll, I'll, I've got a bit of a right foot on me, so I'll just whack it as hard as I can in the direction of the goal. That's my usual technique. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a reasonable one, I'd say. <laughs> So you've said you've been touring for quite a while now. How many more gigs to go? Nine more in the next two weeks from when we're recording this. 
So, yeah, I, I expect me to be um, slightly chaotic, maybe a bit unhinged because, uh, you know, I've been saying the same words for a long time now. So I, I do try and play around with it a little bit so they become um, good, fun, playful, collaborative shows. Yeah. So you are on at Exeter Phoenix. So next Wednesday, the something of something. 28th, um, I think it is. 28th of February. And yeah, I'm very excited. I've got some comedy mates down in down in Exeter, so I'll be meeting up with them to hang out. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be a good fun one. I'm looking forward to it. Well, usually I volunteer at the Phoenix sometimes and, and then I get in for free. But well, you, you were so popular, Chloe. The volunteers have got in before me this mm. time. And so I'm going to have to pay real money. And I think I'm in row C. Oh, great. Well, you've already paid. You should, we shouldn't have had to pay. We could get you in for free next time. But thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. There'll be one person in the volunteers in. So I'll look forward to seeing you, Cathy. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining me today chloe and good luck with the show folks please do go and see chloe pets at the exeter phoenix on february the 28th at 7 30 p.m that'll be great thanks so much for having me take care